In this video, we're going to learn about horizontal cells and how horizontal cells produce lateral inhibition. In order to understand this, we'll take a look again at the cells that we find in the retina. You should be familiar already with these basic cells. Here we've illustrated cones. Those are photoreceptors and I've labeled them cone 1 and cone 2 so that we can easily distinguish them. We also have bipolar cells labeled bipolar 1, bipolar 2, and the ganglion cells with ganglion 1 and ganglion 2 whose axons come together to form the optic nerve and to send information to the brain. Now, as we've talked about previously, the neurotransmitters that are released from photoreceptors onto bipolar cells are inhibitory neurotransmitters. And that's why I've drawn these inhibitory synapses. These other synapses we'll take a look at in just a moment. So, as we've already learned, when light strikes a photoreceptor, the photo photoreceptor hyperpolarizes. That means that there will be less release of the inhibitory neurotransmitter into the synapse. Therefore, when there's light here or light here, these bipolar cells will not be inhibited so much anymore and they can increase their firing rates back towards their, their spontaneous firing rates. If these bipolar cells have excitatory connections to their ganglion cells, then when light is here and the bipolar cell is disinhibited, the ganglion cell will receive excitatory neurotransmitters and that will increase the activity of the ganglion cell. Because this photoreceptor is receiving more light than this photoreceptor, we would understand that bipolar cell number one will be uh, have less inhibition on it than bipolar cell number two. In other words, bipolar cell number one will be more disinhibited than bipolar cell 2 is. Consequently, ganglion cell number 1 will receive more excitatory signals than ganglion cell number 2. We can reflect this up here by uh, having each one of these tick marks represent an action potential generated by the ganglion cell. Ganglion cell number 1 generates, we'll say, 12 action potentials in a second. But since this is receiving cone number two is receiving less light, then bipolar cell two is not as disinhibited as bipolar cell number one. Therefore, it doesn't send as many excitatory signals to ganglion cell number two. Ganglion cell number two's output then will be lower than ganglion cell number one. And in our example, we'll say that the output is now four action potentials per second. Now we're going to add in the horizontal cells. And I've drawn two. We have horizontal cell number one, which is synapsing, or has a synapse from cone number one onto it, and then sends its axon over to produce inhibition on bipolar cell two. Horizontal number, cell number two receives its input from cone number two, and then sends its axon over to bipolar cell number one. Again, it's an inhibitory synapse. Now, I, I want to stress here that the circuitry that I've drawn is simplified so that we can understand the principle of lateral inhibition. All right, we're going to throw in some uh, hypothetical numbers. Again, I want to emphasize this is hypothetical. This is just to help us to understand the principle. We'll say here that because of the number of photons cone number one is receiving, that it is experiencing 30 units of hyperpolarization. Those 30 units of hyperpolarization would be greater than the 10 units of hyperpolarization that cone number two is receiving because it's receiving less light. So if cone one has 30 units of, of hyperpolarization, that would mean both bipolar cell number one and horizontal cell number one are more strongly disinhibited than bipolar cell two or horizontal cell two where there are only 10 units of inhibition. 
Now we're going to assume, because of the ease of the mathematics, that each horizontal cell produces 10% inhibition. So if there are 30 units of disinhibition here on horizontal cell number one, then it'll take 10% of this disinhibition and apply it over here as inhibition. Likewise, horizontal cell number two is generating 10 units of inhibition for each unit of disinhibition that it receives. So if we work the math, here's what we can see. We can see that since horizontal cell number one is receiving 30 units of disinhibition, its total output would be three units of inhibition to bipolar cell number two. So we'll come over here. Since we know that the total output on ganglion cell number two was four, we're going to take away three representing that inhibition coming from horizontal cell number one. That leaves us with a total of one unit. And so what would happen to the output here instead of having four action potentials per second, it would drop to one action potential per second. Now if we look over here at horizontal no cell number two and we take 10% of the disinhibition, that ends up being a value of one. So there'll be one unit of inhibition coming from horizontal cell number two over to bipolar cell number one. Again, we'll come over and we'll do the math. If we subtract 1 from 12, we end up with 11. So there would be, instead of having 12 action potentials per second, there would only be 11 action potentials per second. So there's 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Prior to the lateral inhibition, before we did anything with the horizontal cells, we saw that ganglion cell number one had an output of 12 action potentials per second. Ganglion cell number two had the output of four action potentials per second. The difference between those two was eight action potentials per second. We'll just abbreviate that as APS. That's not an official abbreviation, an, an official abbreviation, but that's what we'll use. Now, though, since we've added the lateral inhibition in from horizontal cell number one and horizontal cell number two, we can see that we have 11 from number one, 11 action potentials per second, one action potential per second from ganglion cell number two. The difference between those two is 10 action potentials per second. So it's easy for us to see then that what lateral inhibition does is it increases contrast, referring to differences in brightness. Here, there's more brightness than here. Without lateral inhibition, it looked like there was only this much difference in the brightness. Lateral inhibition actually increased the amount of contrast between the two areas of brightness. The purpose of lateral inhibition, then, is to increase contrast. That increase in contrast makes it easier for our visual system to detect edges. That's the end of this video.